Um, if you don't know, my name is Holly Hoffman. I am the CEO and founding partner of the Sales and Income Tax Advisory Network. Previously, I just started that in November of 19. Previous to that, I worked at the Wisconsin Department of Revenue as an auditor and a sales tax specialist. So like writing the articles and the publications, um, implementing new tax law, um, writing administrative code, working with um, legislative proposals, things of that nature. So this session, we are talking about audit, which I think we've been talking about the whole, <laughs> whole last session, but it's a good topic. I wanted to kind of start off on a more controlled topic to get through some things that I think are important when we're talking about audit. Assessing your audit risk or things you should be thinking about, your reporting, um, internal controls, banking and record keeping, all really important and I'm sure you're doing it all great. But sometimes you're asking for an audit without realizing it. So for reporting, if you're a campground owner, you have taxable sales, you should be registered for a seller's permit. I'm sure everyone here is. If you know people who own campgrounds and you like them, and they aren't registered, I would highly recommend suggesting to them to get registered because it's easy to identify that uh, for DOR, but that's just asking for an audit. Reporting errors. So if you always are reporting use tax and then one year or one quarter, you suddenly have no use tax um, and then start reporting again, that's probably an error but it would be something DOR might pick up on and come out to audit. Another reporting error, and it doesn't mean that you're reporting the incorrect amount of tax, but it's how you're reporting. So line one of your sales and use tax return is total sales. That's total taxable and non-taxable. Any sales, your equipment, um, used vehicles, whatever, that was part of the business, any of that should be in your sales number on line one and it should match what's reported, well, for the year, line one should match your income franchise return of what your total income is. There may be a couple discrepancies because income tax might have some. Well, there are huge discrepancies, like we start taking money for <coughs> reservations for next year, so that's unearned income, not on the income statement, that's on the balance sheet, so that's not gonna match. That makes sense. But they will know for the industry that that's generally. But let me tell you, if they did come out to audit, because those don't match, and it's just one of the calculations that they run, they match that all the time. And anyone who has a huge difference, they set them up for audit. Um, <clears throat> when they come out, you need to be able to explain that to the new auditor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's something that you should be able to identify. But they're going to look and they're going to ask for a reconciliation. Why don't these numbers match? And you'll have to explain it. I feel like it's just, <laughs> I feel like that's such a simple. It is, but it doesn't match, so it's gonna flag them. Um, it, it could flag an audit, that's the whole thing. That's what I don't But really it's the correct way to do it. Right. So you don't have a choice. <laughs> but if the person was looking at the audit, so first step is it would flag it. Second step is, does it make sense? So I feel like you could match up and realize that it does equal out over the years and identify that. So that should be the auditor's next step when they're assigned the audit, they look into it, they look at your website, see what you're doing, do your percentage of taxable sales make sense, you know, is there an explanation for certain things. Some people on line one, so that's an okay. Some people think it's only taxable sales because it's the sales tax return it's an honest mistake, and I, when I audited, I never saw two people fill out the sales and use tax return the same. So there's lots of interpretations, and it doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. But just know, if you're just putting taxable sales in line one, it's gonna be a huge dif difference from your income tax return, 
and that would flag an audit and they would think, hmm, are they not reporting all their taxable sales and then they'll come out. And you don't want them to come out because you don't want them to look at all your but purchases. No, no, line one is total sales. Okay. Sales. Used to, so the top half of the, well, I'm used to the paper returns. The first part that you fill out in my tax account is all sales, and then you move to use tax. Yeah. yeah. So with that all sales, is that just normal revenue, or could that be revenue plus you sold a $20,000 piece of equipment and brought in that $20,000 income? All business revenue. So if you make sales to employees, you sell your used truck, if it's a business asset, um, that would all be reported in total sales. Um, other reporting errors, I say it's really good to, when you fill out your returns, to keep a running spreadsheet that compares the columns of what you reported, because that's when you can see your trends and sometimes maybe a vendor stopped charging tax or you picked up a new vendor and that's something you would see in a trend of a difference in tax you're reporting or use tax you're reporting. And it might be okay, but at least it gives you a sense or if you accidentally report in the wrong box or there's all sorts of things that can happen. New employee doesn't um, follow the procedures or something. So I say put it in a spreadsheet and compare the columns of what you're reporting on your sales and use tax return. That's the first thing the auditor is going to look at. And it's such a high level view and so simple to see, mm, I'm going to go right for this. This is what I'm looking at. So not amending Wisconsin returns after an IRS audit. If you get an IRS audit and there's adjustments, you're not thinking sales tax, but there might be sales tax implications. So just um, when it happens, not that you want to be paying more tax or dealing with more <laughs> tax issues, but if you have an IRS audit, depending on what the adjustments are, make sure they don't affect sales tax. If they do, make sure you're remitting an amended return for that period or those periods because everything is shared between DOR and IRS. So those audit reports are sent right to DOR and it's set up for review for audit. Um, and then assuming, we talked about this last hour, but assuming an accountant is properly preparing your sales and use tax return, if you hire an accountant to do income tax and they also prepare sales tax, have a conversation to know are they really um, handling your sales and use tax? Are they providing you advice? Do they know what you're doing? Or are you just giving them numbers and you're responsible and they aren't going to ask you because they don't want to have a conversation about your sales and use tax. So just make sure that you're understanding what role your accountant's playing. Internal controls. So if you've been through an audit you know that one of the things they look at is consistency. If there's not consistency in how things are done, they assume you're not doing it correctly and they're going to lean towards taxing versus not taxing. Um, your explanations may not hold as much weight. So we were talking earlier about determining how your business works, your purchases, your sales, figuring out what's taxable, not taxable based on your facts and maybe create some procedures. Make sure your staff's trained so that they understand why they're doing what they're doing. So when something does change, a new vendor or um, you add a new sale, that your staff is picking up on that. Um, if you are having someone else prepare your returns and they have bookkeepers entering the data, are they watching for the data? Do you, ha you, know, do you have procedures of alerting them what's uh, what? Banking. Everyone mingles sales tax with income, but I just want to clearly stress the fact that sales tax is not your money, it's not income, 
and the state will come down very hard on you if you spend sales tax. So um, regardless of the situation, and every year there's a couple court cases that usually go pretty high up, but all the rulings are 100% in favor of the state that any sales tax collected must be remitted to the state. It doesn't matter what situation you're in. It doesn't matter if it wasn't supposed to be a taxable sale, but you accidentally collected the tax so you didn't remit it because it wasn't a taxable sale. If you collect tax from your customer, it has to be remitted to the state. If it was collected in error and you don't want to remit it to the state, you have to refund it to the customer. If you fall on hard times and you pay bills with your sales tax, just know that that's technically stealing and that's the state's money. So just be very careful about that. Sales tax adds up and if you start spending it instead of remitting it, it's very hard to catch up. You get in a really bad situation. Business paying personal credit cards. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, there's accounting that you can do that's totally legitimate. But if your business is paying your personal credit cards, that brings it into the sales and use tax audit. So I highly suggest finding a different way to work that out accounting wise. If you make business purchases with your personal credit card um, occasionally or regularly, and you also have personal purchases on there, I would find a different way to reimburse you for those business purchases because when you get in the sales and use tax audit, you don't want to expand what they can look at. You want to limit it. And if your business is paying a personal credit card bill, again, not illegal. It's just that any personal purchases you made that you didn't remit use tax on, they are going to pick up and tax you. So just be very careful about that. I've seen a lot of issues with that. Record keeping. Everything is taxable unless you can prove to the contrary. So record keeping is huge. Um, if something's exempt, you need to document the criteria for the exemption. If something's non-taxable, you need to clearly understand why it's non-taxable so you can explain it. Um, your taxable sales, your taxable purchases, making sure you're keeping record that you collected the tax or you paid the tax. Um, we talked earlier um, last session about occasional sales. So if you purchase stuff from a rummage sale or my favorite Craigslist or something like that where it's an individual selling their household goods, maybe someone um, selling their lawn tractor like my dad did, he had a really nice one. Would have been a nice pickup. Um, but that's an occasional sale for that person. It's for, they don't hold a seller's permit. It's a sporadic, um, rare sale. So their sale is exempt. They don't have to collect tax. But that also means your purchase of that item is exempt. You don't have to pay use tax on that. But you have to document that it was an occasional sale who you purchased it from, when, um, all the information about the transaction. Because obviously they wouldn't be giving you an invoice. Did you pay tax on stuff and you didn't have to? Do you get credit on the audit? That is an excellent question. She just asked, if you pay tax on stuff and you weren't supposed to, do you get credit on your audit? And I should have mentioned this. So when I started auditing, we were all about the correct tax. We looked if you overpaid, we looked if you underpaid. As of the last couple years, and I don't know if anyone's been audited in the last couple years, yes. they look for tax that you owe. They will not remotely look at anything you paid tax on. They won't discuss it, they don't care, they flip the invoice or they avoid it. They're just looking for sales tax you owe. If you get in an audit, it is 100% upon you to identify if you overpaid tax, which if you had known it at the time, why would you have overpaid? So, By the time it's over, you don't care. You just write the check. Right. Well, I know, but I thought maybe you did. Years 
go, did you get credit? You, can you get credit. still can get credit, yeah. but years ago, I used to tell you, or when I audited, I would do up the work papers just like assessing, and I would. Go through all of our stuff, and here, this is what we paid, and we got it reduced by 30000 Yes, and you want to make sure. So the auditor's not going to do it for you, so don't assume that's happening. You need to do it on your own. If you need to hire me, we'll make it happen. But you need to look at that on your own. Don't assume that's happening. It's not going to happen. And then you want to make sure it's done in the audit because then it offsets any tax due, which then reduces your interest yes. and any penalties. And that is huge, right? From 87 to 53. Big number. Yeah. It depends on if they purchased your entire business and it's continuing, they're going to be liable for what you did. So it's good for you if you're selling. If you're buying a campground, <laughs> no one's going to buy your campground now. No. <laughs> If you're buying a campground or a bar or anything like that, there's this thing called successor's liability, and you can have a certain amount of the sale or the purchase amount put in trust until DOR clears that there's no sales and use tax liability by the previous owner, and I just can't recommend that enough. Because... Yeah, it's like a bond. For the success, oh, sales tax audits, I'm, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> sales tax audit goes back four years if you're registered, it goes back six years if you're not registered or if there's fraud, so, yeah, four years is, Intent, if they can prove it was intentional. 87 grand? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, if, 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 you, if you just didn't know any better, then they're, they're more lenient. So when, when I was auditing four to eight years ago, I assessed fraud in my second year, and they said, oh, you can't do that. We've, we haven't done that. I don't think we've done that in the history of DOR. So it's you have to you have to show intent. <laughs> but most people aren't. I mean, this was very clear, like crystal clear. Like they had petty cash that they had over a million dollars run through, and their petty cash was the under the table money. That's what they said. It's our business, that's our money. <laughs> and I said, I get, I get that, because it was a family-owned business, but it was a C-Corp, so it's like, it's not your money, it's the, anyways. But, so that was very, that was like so crystal clear. Everyone else I audited, other than the embezzler and some other <laughs> people, it was not, I mean, you really have to be, it's not the general person, generally people, and even. Well, you know, a lot of times, like, Saying yes, yes, you do, but the guy I'm buying for says no, you don't. So, you know, and let me be. Pay use tax, that's great, but I want to know for sure. And let me be clear about that. So there's fraud. Fraud penalty is 50 percent. There's negligence. That negligence penalty is 25 percent. So the situation where you were told by your seller, that's negligence. So you would get a 25% penalty. And I think they pretty much start out with negligence on everything. I mean, it's not that I did it on purpose. It was what I was told. Yeah. But they're going to call that negligence. So, and to me, that kind of feels like fraud, but it's not. 
when you get hit with fraud, that really, wow. <laughs> but yeah, then I had a couple audits actually go to court, so that was good. That's unusual. But again, very clearly illegal activity going on. So that's not the usual. That's not you guys. That's not the normal situation. But the 25% negligence penalty that they'll put on immediately. Can I? <laughs> four years, yeah. Yep. All four years. Purchases and sales. And penalty, it gets interest gets compounded on top of that immediately, retroactively. Yes. Yes. It's a and FYI, penalties are negotiable. Yeah. I think that's that's great, but it's unfair. I, penalty isn't supposed to be automatically imposed. <coughs> it's supposed to be if it's significant or, you know, a real lack of due diligence. Um, so definitely, if you get hit with penalty, uh, push back hard on that and get that reduced. The other thing is when they come out and audit, they're going to assess. They're going to look at all your records and then give you this big spreadsheet and say, this is what we have questions about or what we're taxing. I don't know how they're going to present it to you if they're saying you owe tax on this or this is what I'm questioning. They're putting anything and everything on there that they think might, that they're not sure about the law on. They're going to put it on there, and you're going to have to go through and identify what, what was what, right? So, so be very diligent the way you file things, so it's easy to find. Because if, if you can't find it in a timely manner, like by tomorrow, then they think you're stalling. You mean the receipt? Yep. Yep. Okay. Then they might think yeah, that you're you stonewalling and stalling. Yeah, okay, so. Then they might just start looking for any little thing instead of that specific thing. So do a good job filing your stuff away. So what if, like a receipt, can't you go back to the customer or the person you bought from if, if to try to get a copy? Yes, yes. So if that would take like more than a day. day. Well, like we bought yeah. some at JCPenney four years ago. Like, I don't think I can go back to JCPenney. Right, right. Which I know I paid sales tax, but I can't come up with a receipt. So, I agree. so OK, so she's talking about buying something from JCPenney's. I would push back hard without even a receipt. Because they always charge you tax. Exactly. I don't know if they charge you If you went to Minnesota and purchased it in Minnesota, J.C. Penney's is still a company. Well, unless it was clothing. Right. Or a non-taxable thing. Let me clarify. Do you show what it was? That's not right. It was 70 bucks, so I wasn't going to argue. But I would push back hard on those kinds of things and say, I mean, definitely if it's a Wisconsin company, um, if you're not a farmer or generally don't purchase without resale and you have multiple receipts from, say, Fleet Farm and it always shows that you paid tax, but you can't find the 20 receipts they're trying to tax you on, I would argue that clearly I pay tax to them. They charge tax. I would argue to have it removed and push hard on that. Like there's some things that I just feel like are such a, things that I wouldn't have picked up, I would have been like, eh. So I have a suggestion that I learned from MBE. Um, for those of you that use QuickBooks and have a smartphone, you can download an app called Receipt Bank. So when you go to Menards, take a picture of it, and your tax person will help you connect it to your QuickBooks. QuickBooks looks to match that. So when it sees it come in, it goes to receipt bank, pulls it in, and then there's a picture of it on every entry on QuickBooks. This app is called Receipt Bank. Well, QuickBooks has its own app for taking pictures anyways. That's what is it QuickBooks Online? Yes. Or? Yeah. I was going to say, is that work for the desktop? That's a good question. I would assume so. Yeah, she, she showed us at the last one earlier this morning about, oh yeah, just take a picture right here. <laughs> what do you all on that what was yours called? on my phone, I can show you if anybody's interested in this whole year. Um, but that is so immediate. It's just sitting in there. It matches. Because uh, I'm getting ready for the audit, right? Yeah. So it's very time. Doesn't help us Are four years ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> I 
I mean, anything you can do to have complete and accurate records and don't be too overly complete like my fraud people and enter every detail about how you were feeling that day into your QuickBooks when especially you're entering inappropriate purchases or <laughs> telling me telling me you have no money but you're flying in au pairs to interview for mm. I mean why do you put all that information in your QuickBooks come on her husband like just oh my god he lost it on her like why would you do that why would you put that in there um, make sure you're keeping returns and have work papers to back up and explain how you came to the numbers that you reported on the return how I said that everyone reports differently just because you put it in the wrong column doesn't mean that they can pick it up for sales tax or use tax if it's legitimately exempt. Maybe you put not taxable property under exemption certificates and they say, well, you don't have exemption certificates, you know, come on. So a question with sales records. Mm -hmm. I, I talked to him briefly earlier about this. So. In February, I collected $15,000 worth of uh, prepaid reservations for, let's just make it one month, July. I should have filed my return as zero sales and then the tax amount collected on that? No, it is, on your sales tax return, it is a sale. On your income tax, it well, may not be a tax, sale. Tax, books, and financial, two sets of books. Well, you have yeah. deposit money. <clears throat> Just phone. like the mafia. Deposit money. Yes. And on your balance sheet, it says how much deposits you collected for the previous year. So that's what you got to manage is that amount, at which you pay tax on that's okay. So then when you, the person comes in in July, you take that and you deposit minuses, and then it shows that's what I was going to say, because then in July it would show 15,000 sales, but really no sales tax to pay. No, on the sales tax return, sales will mean tax because that's when the sale occurs. Okay. That's when you're reporting it. So if a sale didn't it's occur. It's not reported as a sale. It's putting on his balance sheet as a liability. It's a deposit. Right, but it's still taxable. Yeah. Yes, it's a taxable, taxable liability. Okay, on. So that money is transferred to a sale, that's when the tax deposit. There's, really there's a difference between income and a sale. So it's going to be a sale on your sales tax return because the sale occurred according to the definition of a sale for sales tax. So that's when it's going to be one of those situations where the two may not match up, your income tax return, if it's not in the same year, and your sales tax return. But it is. That's when the sale occurs is when you need to collect tax so based on the sales tax. The word sales versus revenue. Sale versus income. Yeah. <sighs> okay. So the simplifier of life just reported as a sale in December and be done with it. Pretty tough to compare years then. It yeah. Mm. Sales records. Make sure you're keeping sales records um, that show who you were selling to, what you sold, a good description. If you charge sales tax, that's broken out preferably. Um, if sales tax included, make sure it's written on the invoice. Um, if it's not written on the invoice, it's supposed to be clearly displayed at your facility. But I think that it's unfair to the customer, like we were talking about, if you are including sales tax and it's not on their invoice because then they have no documentation really to show that sales tax was included when they get audited. Um, if you have a different way of you don't give invoices or you record things differently, make sure whatever log you keep or information that it's clear and understandable. case a fire hits or you get flooded. 
exemption certificates. If any of your customers are exempt, make sure you're invoicing them or recording the sale to that entity that gave you the exemption certificate. Um, if you're working with a nonprofit and they are holding an event at your campground, the nonprofit's exempt, but folks who attend that are renting campsite as a part of that event, if the, if the individuals are paying for their campsites, they are not exempt. Their purchases are not exempt. So we do a, a benefit for a 501c3, and we collect the money if they're doing a golfing thing, and it's $3 a person, and we collect it and turn it all over to them. But because we're collecting the money and then paying them, is that taxable? Is there any way I can get that to them and not have to pay sales tax on it if I put it into my register? I'm thinking you just now hit, even if there was a way around it, you just now hit the marketplace provider definition because you're collecting and facilitating the sale on behalf of someone else, so your sale is taxable. Um, so the person would have to pay that entity. I, I don't even want yeah, to they would have to. Bucks, you know, I right. just Instead of being a middle yeah. 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 So I was told if I had a jar. Yeah, and no never, yeah I was thinking if you do a cash it, box. Them, yeah, cash if, box yeah, cash yeah. box or something no, separate. Okay. Well, but yeah. 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 Good point. Thank you. For our charitable 5013C here that we have, yeah. and you take in 10 grand, and we do. That's a big, you know, $500 worth of tax. So we collect the money and we write a check, we're supposed to be paying tax. Instead well, of giving them cash, like you said. I don't know. Well, in this instance, it was a golf outing, and so I know that's well, a tax. That's I, know, but I, I, I would guess it depends on what you're, oh, what you're what doing you're, to, to earn get yeah. money. Okay. And our audit, I just explained it. You can just touch it again. And what, what were well, you collecting? We do like a chili cook I collected it and I deposited it and wrote a check. I don't for, do what were you collecting it for? All the give around stuff we did, whatever if it was a run walk or an auction or a whatever. I just want to say, I don't do that anymore. I want to say she had a brand new auditor, but also <laughs> as <laughs> of. As of January 1st, there's now a marketplace provider law, and a marketplace provider is required and liable for tax on a sale if they are collecting the money and facilitating the sale on behalf of someone else. So. Even if it's 501. So if we collect money for Gil Brown Foundation, we should not write a check. We should just. So that's what we should do. But, but if your records show that you were the one collecting the money, you're facilitating the sale. It doesn't matter if you write a check. It's about the fact that you're collecting payment and facilitating the sale. But like, say we had a chili cook-off. We didn't buy the chili. The people brought it. You know, the people in the competition mm -hmm. brought the chili. We charged people $5 for tasting it and judging. And then we gave that money to Gilbert Brown. So, so a donation is considered a sale? If, it's, if you're requesting a specific amount, it's not a donation. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah. So, so anywhere between $17.99 and 1801. <laughs> that would be specific, yeah, huh? Okay. So if we yeah. just say it's a donation and don't have an amount on there. Yeah, if it's donation and no amount, suggested amount can be considered an amount. All right. For a sale. The legal organization should know that because right. yeah, Gilbert, yeah. with Gilbert stuff. Yeah, yeah. because That's we raised lots of money, I think, and I don't think everybody gave them a hundred thousand. Let me, cash. let me, let me research whether or not there's any get around. But I'm concerned. So the marketplace provider law is new, and it's to fix some things that holes that were created because of Wayfair. Let me just research and see 
I know there's going to be some not so good implications as a result of the marketplace provider, but let me see if there's anything. And what I'm going to do is give that answer to Lori at Waco okay. so she can pass it on yeah. to you guys. So I wasn't really thinking about that, but then when you started talking about it, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a marketplace provider. Um, so let me do it that way. Then everyone gets the answer. Yeah, okay, thank you. That's a good one. So that's, that's my spiel on um, audits. I think it's good to be involved in your audit even if you hire someone so that you can hear what's going on and what they're asking. When you're in an audit, and they ask you things or ask you for information. I know you said they get mad if they have to wait, but don't just automatically blurt out stuff of, well, it's this, and don't try to think what the auditor is thinking. If it's a new auditor, they may not know what they're thinking, and they're going to throw things at the wall and see what you come back with. So take your time, figure out what you're doing if you're not sure what you're doing and you have an accountant involved kind of look into if there really is a question and what you can do but yeah take your time if you ask the auditor a question they're going to be like I'll get back to you because they don't know the That's answer exactly what did happen. Uh, I asked some questions back of our fresh off the boat auditor and he had to get back to her yeah so that's what they do and that's what you should do and it looks I understood that people were quickly trying to answer because they were nervous, but they can take whatever answer suits them best and say, well, that's what you said, so that must have been what you did, even though you were quickly answering and that really wasn't the situation. So just be really, um, and then also you can control, especially with the new auditors, it's your business. You know how things are kept in your records. You should be guiding and controlling the auditor of, there are certain things they're going to look at, but if they do a sample or if there's electronic records, you know, guiding them, this is what this is, explaining to them. So it's more under your way of doing things instead of the auditor creating their own or dingling around, for <laughs> wasting time um, spinning on things. So, <clears throat> yeah. How about meat raffles? <laughs> yeah. And so I, I think I asked this to, who was the other one? Abrams, I think. I, I talked to somebody, I can't remember who it was. And ours, our proceeds benefit the Gilbert Brown Foundation. And so it's the whole, is it meat? Okay. So, so raffles, <laughs> raffles, the price to get into a raffle to participate is not taxable. If you're giving away a TV or any items that are taxable, you have to pay tax on that. If it's meat, no, that's not taxable. Um, Unless it's chocolate covered bacon or something. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> and then. So I need to make some cheesecake so I can get those out of there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, wait, what did you say? Cheesecake? Yeah, well, well let's. That's not. Let's just do me. Right? Okay, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> the only other thing that's subject to tax is if you use tickets or anything like that, your purchase of the tickets is taxable. Is taxable. So. so. Mm hmm. Did you understand what I meant? Your purchase of the tickets yeah. is taxable. Yeah. Yeah. Not the yeah. thirty thousand we yeah. made out of the meat raffle. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you for that answer. Glad I could help. <laughs> well, and that's the answer I got before, but then I just. Oh, you, I got my list on my basket once already. 
Oh, so we started talking last session, <clears throat> like it sidetracked, about real versus personal property, and that's a common question. And I provided a printout that you should keep so when you hire people to come do work that you, oh, I'm sorry, here you go. Thank you. Um, that you can check. And the reason why we have a cheat sheet at DOR, or they have a cheat sheet at DOR, is because if it's real for installation, it may or may not be real for repair. So real property means that if you're hiring a contractor and they're doing real property work for you, your purchase is not taxable. Their sale to is not taxable. Real property is not taxable. The contractor is the consumer of any materials that go into that job, so they gotta pay tax on their materials. If you hire a contractor to do personal property, the sale to you is taxable. The contractor can purchase any materials physically transferred to you without tax for resale. If you are deciding to do the work on your own or have your employees do the work, and you purchase materials, it doesn't matter if it's going into real or personal properties. Your purchase of the materials is a purchase of tangible personal property. You're not purchasing real property. You're purchasing tangible personal property. You're needing to pay tax, sales tax or use tax on the purchase of those materials. There was a question, some people asked, well, if we hire our employee to do the work, we pay for the materials, but we pay our employee for labor to do the work. Is the employee's <coughs> labor taxable? Employee's labor is never taxable, subject to sales tax. So um, just so you know, unless you're selling it to your customers in, as part of a service. The so, other. Can you, so can you give a real example, like on the second page, it says air conditioning on the window. So how do you, you read that chart on the property? Okay, so on. Page two, second item is air conditioner window. Well, let's do the first line, air conditioner central. That's if it's installed in the building and it's serving. Most um, buildings have central. For install, if you hire your contractor to come out and install the air conditioner, that's a real property job. Even if they're like my house, the roof is real steep, and the first two years we replaced our air conditioner twice before we got an ice rail. So when we hired a contractor to come out and install a new one, he took out the old one and replaced it with a new one. That's a new installation, that's installation, that's a real property job. When we have the contractor come out that's personal, or that's real property, it's under install. It was at my residence, so that's real. If it's at your business, say your office, um, and you have a regular building with an office, a fixed to realty, it's gonna be real there too. If you have the same contractor come out because the air conditioner needs maintenance, it's spring, you wanna tune up, that's considered personal property. So now the contractor's charge to you for materials and labor is taxable. So that's, the that's not the process function. Oh. That's real estate. Process function is, why can't I just off the top of my head think of something for a campground? There's lots of stuff at the campground that's <coughs> process function. Process function doesn't serve a building purpose. So like an air conditioner or furnace in your office is serving a building purpose. Process function, that's still generally gonna be serving business, fun um, a general real estate function. An example I can think of off the top of my head is air conditioner in a server room where it has to keep the servers cool at a certain temperature. Now it might be the same style air conditioner, but now it's serving a process function. It's not serving the building, it's serving a specific process function. So if they're in the manufacturing building and they repair a something, something, whatever, whatever, that's a process function? Mm-hmm. 
Yep. If it's specific to the business process. Or if you guys have restaurants in your business and you have in the kitchen, that's process function items, the sink, um, things like that. Even though it's installed in your home, it would be real, but it's in a process function now because it's a kitchen for a restaurant. Over the grill, you have the exhaust hoods. That's process function, that's personal, even though it's installed. Um, also, if you have fire suppression systems, if it's serving the general building, it's real property, but it's, if it's over like a grill or something specific for that, that's process function. And the difference is what? One is taxable, one is not? If it's a process function, it's personal for install and personal for repair. Process function is taxable. And you might have something that serves both. Okay? So then you look at primarily, more than 50% does it serve the building or does it serve a process function? If you have an office building or a lodge and inside that you have a break room, that's a little kitchen, that's considered real property. Bathrooms are always real property um, and janitorial closets. So if you have a sink or shelving in a janitorial closet, that's always considered real property. Shelving built in, reception desk built in, um, if you have dust or anything like that built in, inventory shelving built in, that's all process function and that's personal. It's going to be taxable for install or repair. Bathroom, I said, is always building function, but on here it has bathroom fixtures, wherever it is. Bathroom fixtures are real for install, personal for repair, whether it's residential or <laughs> in a business. Because I don't know. I got, I got in trouble at DOR once because when I was speaking to contractors. And the reason it's personal for some of these things is because there's a list in the statute of certain items. That's why carpet is real for install, but personal for repair or cleaning. And I said, I don't know. Don't try to apply logic to it. It's stupid. <laughs> I mean, it's accurate, but I got in trouble. <laughs> the Boston Tea Party was a what, what, penny tax on tea? That's the only thing we could tax on that. So I was just at a conference a couple weeks ago when we could still travel. <laughs> and they started out the sales tax conference with an economist. And I'm like, oh, I'm just in love with this guy. Like, not literally, but his ideas. Because he was talking about sales tax, how I always say it's supposed to be, like everyone would be willing to pay a little more by having everything taxed, but like a small amount of tax. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just crystal clear, just yeah. easy, yeah. just boom. Yes. Yeah. But instead we have higher tax rates, and Wisconsin isn't that bad compared to most states, but higher tax rate, but crazy tax law, it's a small tax base, the items that are taxable, small, and then they keep exempting stuff, which makes it worse. So, I don't know. If someone would please run for office. <laughs> I have one more question from the past. Yeah. Customer that cancels for a no-show, but when yeah. I collected the money, it was a deposit, so I paid the tax. Is it still taxable or is that a non-tax item now because I never came? It depends. Oh. Uh, right here. <laughs> so if someone cancels and the room's made available to someone else, then you can get your tax back. If the room is canceled but the room's not available, 
It's not for a resale? And if you and want, if that can be. If you rent that site or room, then it's taxable. If available. not, and if okay. I'm gonna, there's like a couple things about that. So how about I add that to my okay. published list? No show because you didn't rent it because you expect it to show up. And so you know, you money that's whether or not you refund the money to the tax to them. I wouldn't refund the tax to them. I don't know how to read. I got like 25 of them. And there's a lot. When, one of my first audits, so you start 10 audits all at once. And most of them were larger amounts. And I was new and stupid. And one person had 6,000 before we even reduced it, like before we got talking about what we could take off the assessment. And I said, well, the good thing is, is you don't owe much. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> He's like, $6,000, that's a lot, which it is a lot. Like, I couldn't pay $6,000, but like, oh. And then another audit, one of my first ones, I thought, oh, it's the only people who are getting a refund, $10,000 refund. I was happy to go out and do the closing. Like, yes, all right. It was the worst closing ever because the gentleman on the contractor business, his girlfriend was doing the books. She was doing it willy-nilly. And although it worked out OK for this audit, he had overpaid tax. And he could have really used that for equipment and other things. And she was all like, this is great. We're going on vacation. I already know where we're going. And I'm going to do this even more. And I'm like, no. I'm like, no, you're not. You're never going to get audited again. Just no. And that guy just lost it on her. He ended up walking out, slamming the door. And I was, I was like, oh my god. <laughs> just lesson learned, do not assume. I've had better ones where I assessed them a lot of money. And oh. Any other questions about audit or? A lot of stuff is reasonable. If it's reasonable, exemption certificates, if it's reasonable, if you have a store and you do cash sales and I don't know, or you sell inventory items or something and someone gives you an exemption certificate, just make sure that it's not a cash sale, that you're identifying who it was sold to without tax so you can match up the exemption certificate. So, so back to the, um, if I give away a free weekend, it's worth $320. Do I record a sale as $320 and then a coupon and then so it's a zero sales? Or do I still record that full sales on the... You gave it away so there is no sale. So I, I would, it's absolutely no sale period. The only way it would be a sale is if you gave it away in exchange for advertising or something okay. of value. Right, right. Okay, for our system. So if you just give it away, you don't have to... Anything going into it would be use tax. Like, say, uh, that's one where there probably wouldn't be anything in it. So, I'm not going to use that example. I'm going to just. I mean, generally, that would just not be a taxable sale, and I can't think of anything that. I mean, it's not a sale, and I can't think of anything that was taxable in there that you would pay use tax on. But, say, you gave away a bicycle or something in a promotion. It's not a sale because it's a giveaway, but you can't purchase without tax for resale. So you pay tax on the purchase of the bike. So 
still like a saving away four slush puppies in a contest. But because he gave it away when I bought the slush puppy mix, I should have paid tax on Oh my God, if they go after you for that. <laughs> well, you know, you I'd be like, have a slush puppy and think about that for a minute. But if you're doing it regularly. Pirates <laughs> Weekend gave away treasure, money, actual money. Are you supposed to pay tax on that? Because you gave away money. Well, money is not taxable unless it's like collector item coins sold above value. Okay. So. But I deducted on income because I gave away. Right. Yep. So it's like a product from a store, like a sword. And you didn't pay tax coming in, but if you gave it away, you should pay tax. Right. You should pay use, use tax. tax. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Just remember a little use tax. Like you put stuff in your game room and you give it away and you don't have to pay sales tax on it. You guys have the interesting yeah, business of you do almost everything and purchase possible? almost like everything, every type of thing. Did you pay sales tax on when you purchased it? No, well, because we're, we pay tax through our Oxford music the vendor. Uh, I think you still got to pay it on the okay. Wait, so say it again. We have a ticket reduction in our game room. And we do like, say, 50 50 with the game room guy. But when we buy the products for our wall, we don't pay tax on them. So they come up and redeem their tickets and get and stuff. I in the believe there's an exemption for that now. No, I didn't pay that. Because I can I add that one to the sure. list and yes. publish it? Prize redemption. Prize redemption. <laughs> This is the best savings okay. account ever. I'm going to do this all the time. The campground owner, Cube Ice, was taxable. Oh, here comes. Now Cube Ice isn't taxable. So when I the block ice is. The block ice is. Oh, go, go ahead. But if it's out of an ice chest where it's not necessarily sanitary that you would put it in your glass, as an auditor, I would, if you were selling that to campers, I would pick that up, sales of that.